You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to Proof Text. I'm Michael Halcom here with J.M. Smith of the Disciple Dojo. Um, program or ministry and uh yeah always looking forward to this episode of or looking forward to these episodes of 10 questions where we pull up a random bible verse and ask 10 questions of it and so uh today uh we are going to venture into the new testament before we do that um jm you doing well i am doing great yeah these are new testament i'm going to defer some of my greek questions to you Although my Greek's getting better. I've been working yeah. every day, every morning. I've been working on my Greek. Excellent. Still at, still at baby level. My pronunciation's <laughs> not there, but but yeah, I thought you'd be happy to know that. Yeah, man. That's <laughs> great news. Um, yeah. Um, well, we will jump into the New Testament. Um, and uh, you, you were saying, uh, well, tell us a little bit before we do that, how you're uh, your grown-ups table it's a singles ministry tell us how that's going yeah it's a ministry that we started through facebook it's it's only on facebook um because that's the platform that people connect with most easily and it's uh it's a group we started for unmarried christian adults so if you're single widow divorce uh in, you know whatever age as long as you're over 18 and it's where people come together and connect get to know each other we're going to do a summer retreat. Our second one is coming up oh, wow. this July down at St. Simon's Island down in Georgia. Um, you know, we had like 65 people. None of them knew each other before the retreat. And then now it's like you best like solid friendships have been created. So we're going to do it again. And we're going to have even more people. I'm bringing in a cool guest speaker who's actually a very high level biblical scholar whose mm. name I can't say just yet because I'm still mm. finalizing details. But uh, it's it's really cool. We just passed 1,900 members yesterday um, of the group, wow. so we're we're getting close to 2,000 members, and they're all over the country. So wherever you are, if you're a single, if you're unmarried, the, the stipulation you have to you can't be legally married. We don't know. I'm separated. Well, you're not technically divorced, so you got to be single in government eyes. <laughs> But if you are and you do need community and you're hurting, whether it is through divorce, whether you're a widow or whether you're just like lifelong single, never met your person. We have people that want to meet their person. We have people that are like, nah, I'm done. I'm, I'm not looking to date. It's just about connection. And it's about getting the community that single adults struggle to find even in churches. So yeah. pull up a chair at the Grown Ups table if you're on Facebook and we'd love to have you. Nice. I um so I was preaching and I'm preaching through the gospel of Mark at our church and we've been in it over a year and a half and I got to Mark 10 uh, last Sunday, 10, one through uh, I think 11 or 12. And this mm. is where Jesus talks about, you know, marriage, divorce, remarriage, adultery. But I was, um, I thought it was good. You maybe would have been proud of me because I, I was talking about, of course, the sanctity of marriage last Sunday, but also I think there's a sanctity of uh, singleness too. Um, yeah. and, um, I don't think we hear that, you know, uh, in church. So it was good to be able to, to talk about what that looks like, the, the holiness of a single person, the sanctity of, of singleness and those sorts of things. And, um, yeah, that this Amen. is way, you know, the single person can honor the Lord for sure. We don't need to just shove marriage down everybody's throats. So, yeah. Cool. So, uh, yeah, you're doing a good work, man. Keep that up, and I appreciate it's, it. It's cool to see that developing, and um, mm. yeah, um, there's a real need for it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's growing faster than I could have expected. <laughs> well, um, you're, you're nothing if if not uh, uh, a creator of things. So it's fun <laughs> to watch you, you know, do your thing and and create some things and develop some things. So. Uh, but it's also fun to discuss scripture with you. So let's get into that. Let's um, do it. Today, we're, like I said, we're going to the New Testament. We're going to the Gospel of Matthew. In particular, we're in Matthew 16. And so if you're watching, you'll be able to see that here on the screen. 
momentarily. Uh, we are at 1618. I just asked a random Bible verse generator, hey, give me a verse. Boom, this is what it gave me. And so uh, Matthew 1618. Ooh, this is a um, kind of a doozy. Uh, so the NIV translates it this way. And I tell you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Wow, that the NIV actually follows pretty well word for word in the Greek. I was reading the Greek there as we were going. Um, mm. So you want to lead off on this one? You want me to lead off? How you want to go? Um, let yeah, I'll. I, I don't mind starting because my question right off the bat is, uh, why doesn't it say the gates of hell? <laughs> that's what most people learn this as saying as the gates of hell that's even yep. a, a phrase and com i think that's king james yeah king james gates of hell why does the niv say hades and what is hades and is it the same as hell that's a great question in greek edes edes <clears throat> really good question um so it's interesting to me uh that he says um, and I say to you that you are Peter. Um, doesn't, I mean, why does Jesus need to tell Peter that he is Peter? Well, doesn't Peter know that Peter is Peter? Why does Jesus need to tell him that? So I'm just curious about this opening line. I tell you, you are Peter. Had Peter forgotten that he was Peter? Did Peter not ever realize he was Peter? Why is Jesus being explicit about this? And I tell you that you're Peter. Yeah. Well, my second question will piggyback right off of yours is we know that Peter, that was his nickname. His his birth mm -hmm. name was Kepha. So is this when Jesus gave him that name or is this like a known name? And Jesus is like, you know, you are Peter dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Therefore, you know, like, so is he appealing to something that's already known? Because he, I think he's called Peter throughout, but the Gospels were all written long after. So mm. had they been calling him by his nickname, or did Jesus in his everyday life call him Kepha? Uh, yeah. I don't well, even you know also, if we could answer that. You also have uh, the Simonos, Simon Peter, right? Um, that's tacked on to uh, the Petros. But... Yeah, and obviously, uh, I guess my second question would be, um, you know, in Greek, the name Peter is Petros. And then later in the sentence, you have, and upon this Petra, I will build. So um, is this word play purposeful? Is it accidental, coincidental? You are Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my church. Yeah. Mm. So what about the wordplay? What's going on with that? Or is it wordplay? Yeah. Mm hmm. Um. Hmm. What? Oh, man. You Okay, I'll, I'll have that for my third question. Is what you said. Well, I have a couple time. of questions because that are yeah. all circulating in my head having to do with the Simon, Shimon, Kepha, Cephas, Petros, Peter. And how those three names, I mean, yeah. it's one guy with three names, when they got introduced and, and is it, I, I guess that'll jump into my third question, which is when he says, and on this Petra, and obviously Catholics and Protestants are sharply yeah. divide over this, but who, what, what Petra, this, this yes. Peter, or this meaning the proclamation that Peter has just made. Because yes. one way would lead you to, there you go, you're the first pope. And the other one leads you to, you know, the gospel is the rock. Uh, Jesus mm -hmm. being the son of God is the rock. And uh, that's what the church is built on. So two wildly different approaches based on one verse. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, you, you made me think. So my third question, uh, you have. Kephas, uh, Kephas, the the sort of Semitic form of his name. Um, it would have been interesting because it's there could have been another word play here. 
um well in greek you have uh in greek at least you have kephale is head um so why not say you are kepha and upon this um uh you will be the kephale mu <laughs> kephale mu tain ecclesian or kephale mu tain you'll be the head of my church mm. that's interesting i just thought of that when you were bringing up uh the semitic form of his name hmm because there's that's tradition related, isn't, just tangentially yeah isn't there's tradition that matthew was originally written in Aramaic. i mean we don't have any evidence other than tradition but that that it was originally written what i think is eusebius or somebody papius or somebody that said it was originally written in the hebrew tongue um and so yeah i just i wonder how much got how much carries over from the aramaic that they would have spoken their everyday life into the koine greek that they would have spoke but may not have been their first language yeah uh, i um i so i'm i'm uh i guess for me personally i don't take the view that any of the gospels or any of the new testament for that matter were written in um hebrew or aramaic first or right. primarily i also take the view that um aramaic was not jesus's primary language mm. um I think Hebrew was, and I I take the view that Hebrew is what was the daily spoken language, not mm. Aramaic. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, for those of you who may be interested in where I'm coming from with this, uh, that that last claim, anyway, um, Steve Notley and uh, Randall Booth they've they've done a really good job uh, in recent years talking about. Uh, or showing in terms of research that Hebrew probably will was still the lingua franca um of everyday use uh during the first century um when it was used like it would have yeah. been used uh before Aramaic would have been used Aramaic would have been like more formal um and so I still think Jesus probably primarily I think he probably spoke Greek as much as he spoke Hebrew Hmm. Like it just depends who his audience was, but I don't think yeah. he was going around speaking Aramaic as his main language. That's my own view. Um, Interesting. Wrong, yeah, I don't. Yeah. What's don't the name? Do you know the name of their work that that you just mentioned? The two authors. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that here in a second. Um, I'm just curious is, for my own reading. It is the language environment of first century Judea. It's a okay. multi multi volume. I think only volume two is out. I don't even, it came out before volume one, interestingly. <laughs> um, so the language environment of first century Judea. And uh, they make the case in there, I think is a solid case um, for what I just suggested. That Hebrew yeah. was the primary language of Jesus, not Aramaic. Right. Um, That's so good to know. Whole, go ahead. Uh, that's, no, that's good to know because it's it's considered just one of those axiomatic truisms that you hear yeah. so much that Aramaic was the native language. I mean, I've certainly that's what I've always thought, and yeah. I'm always interested whenever I hear um, other <laughs> theories, especially things that challenge like well known but not like yeah. doctrinally orthodox, you yeah. know, like nothing of the first order, but just things that challenge long held assumptions on peripheral issues. I'm yeah. always fascinated by that. Yeah, so this book is important in that regard. Um yeah, so let me let me sort of state my position. I think Jesus spoke Greek and Hebrew. I hmm. don't think his primary language is Aramaic, but I think he certainly used it. Hmm. Um at the same time, uh I don't think any of the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. It may have there may have been recensions like of Hebrew that came later, but I don't think it was the initial documents were written in Hebrew. And that is actually a, a place where Randall Booth, author of one of the books I just told you, they have this um, group that has been pushing for years that in fact, uh, decades in fact, that um, the Gospels 
texts were written in Hebrew first, and so they've undertaken this project to rewrite, like uh, to trans back translate the Greek Gospels into Hebrew. Yeah, and this is a project that's been going on and on. I don't buy it. I don't subscribe to that theory. Right. Um, so, you know, that's a it's an interesting thing in scholarship where you you, uh, you agree with some something a scholar says, but then you disagree with something the same scholar says, and that's just yeah. part, of, part of it, right? Um, it's a very healthy thing, I think, is being able because it means you can recognize competing arguments and without like joining it whole cloth to the person who's making the argument and you can yeah, weigh yeah. and evaluate and uh yeah that's a great a great quality yeah. to have for sure uh wading into this whole uh even just the question of what language does what languages did Jesus know and or use mm-hmm. that that's like a whole a whole subfield of new testament studies in and of itself and yeah. there's like tons of articles tons of books and uh you know jesus it's clear that he was able to engage greek hebrew aramaic latin um and i would say there were probably other languages It's clear that he was a polyglot at mm-hmm. some level and certainly multilingual um so yeah it's just interesting I'm, we're like way off on a tangent now but <laughs> it's okay i think maybe listeners are inter- will be interested cause so those I, I questions come up from the text. Like this started by us asking about Petra and Kepha and Shimon and yeah. how they relate. So that's all part of it, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But I have no idea what number question I'm on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we're on four. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That sounds good. We'll go with that. Um, I would want to know this. Um, this la- the last verb. Kadeskiususen, Kadeskiususen, Kadeskiusus. I yeah, like I said, I'm working on my pronunciation. Either way, um, it's <laughs> translated differently. I think NIV has overcome the gates of it. Yeah, will not overcome it. Other translations have prevail against. And the, I want to know if this is a more of an. Why is this an active? type verb if it is like to overcome or to prevail those are active active actions that you do Mm -hmm. but they're being done by gates gates are defensive and they don't move except to open Mm -hmm. or close so great why how does a gate overcome something yes wow great question um my my fourth question would be a geographical one and uh, I, I'm just curious, where is Jesus when he says this? Now, mm. the one thing, you know, as I've been preaching through Mark, uh, in Mark, it's location, location, location. Where something is said matters immensely geographically, right? And so the same in the Gospel of Matthew, same anywhere. Um, I think readers would, would do well to figure out where is Jesus? What is the geographical location that he is at when he makes this statement? And how does that shed maybe some insight on the passage? Yes, that may shed insight on the question I just asked about what are the gates of hell? Yeah. Um, Okay. My last one then will be Jesus is clearly saying that he's going to build his ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Now we just 2000 years later, read that and go, of course he's building his church. I'm a, we're in church. We know a church, but nobody in Jesus's day would have thought about a church. Like we Bro, think, you stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the biblical background of yeah. ecclesia? Is it used in the Septuagint? Trick question. It is. <laughs> what does it mean in the Septuagint? And then, what implications does that have theologically? Yeah, man. Yeah, you totally, uh, you totally <laughs> beat me to the punch there. So, kudos to you on that. 
few of those, by the way, is a Greek word. Um, yeah, so nobody would have been thinking about church in the way that uh, we understand it. So that that's brilliant. Now I got to think of another question, man. Um, <laughs> let's see. That was too um, easy guess... for you. I couldn't let you have that one. It's, it was too <laughs> low hanging fruit. You're the scholar of the two of us. So... Yeah, I mean, well, there was no church at the time that Jesus said this, right? So right. what what liberal scholars have tended to do, in particular New Testament studies, is is to make those sort of claims that, well, this this tells you that probably Matthew put these words in Jesus's mouth because right. the church the church didn't come to exist until after Pentecost, which was after the resurrection, which was after the crucifixion, which was after Jesus's life. So these words had to be put in Jesus's mouth. So there was no such thing as a church. And right. by doing that, they're able to force this dichotomy between what Ma- Matthew's gospel and Jesus's gospel. And um, there's, there's a little bit of validity to that, like raising those sorts of questions. Matthew's perspective is the author versus Jesus's. But I feel like some of that's just forced false dichotomy. Yeah. Um, anyways, my last question, Hugo Domeso. Um, I will build. Um, and upon this rock, I will build. I will build. So I'm wondering how does Jesus intend to build? Um, so, yeah, what, what does that building project and process look like I and mean, what manner is he building like what is this what is the what is the whole yeah architecture of this mm. uh, what are the building plans the blueprints you know so yeah and jesus doesn't say peter will build or anybody else will build. He says, i will build yeah so what does that look like and what does that mean yeah that's my fifth question fifth and final question that's a good so, one. Yeah, well, uh, good stuff, bro. Um, and thanks, everybody, for watching. If you would, subscribe to the channel, share this, um, help get the word out. Head over to DiscipleDojo.org. Head over to JM's uh, Disciple Dojo YouTube page. And, um, yeah, thank you all. If you have uh, verses you'd love to, for hear us, love to hear us talk about or discuss, let us know. Shoot me an email, editors at TulosaHouse.com. You can do that. Or just drop a comment on the YouTube video or wherever you're watching, Facebook. Um, yeah, let us know, Spotify even. And we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll stop there for now. Until next time, we say uh, we hope that helps. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glosa House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.